All right, boy, I'm a little disappointed the worship pastor took away some of my preaching time today, but you'll have that sometimes. <laughs> hey, we're glad you're with us today, and uh, I know the Lord's got something good in store for all of us today to talk about a little bit. And uh, even that song that we sang there, talking about mercy, today we're going to talk a little bit about mercy and the mercy seat, and we're going to go back to the Old Testament to something that maybe some of you don't know a lot about, or maybe you think you do, and hopefully you can learn some further insight from it, because what God put in his living word thousands of years ago makes the gospel of Jesus Christ so much more relevant and powerful today. And we're going to look into that a little bit. So I was trying to think of all the countless times that someone showed me mercy, which is a lot. I wish my father, when I was younger, would have gave me a little bit more mercy, but uh, he was... Uh, a little heavy fisted at times, just in his anger, and uh, the Lord saved his life, but not till I was like in my 20s. So he took a while to calm down, but uh, he would still show me mercy. I just wish I had a little bit more. So I was thinking, I was working, I think I was 17 years old, 18 years old, and I was working for a butcher shop, like upscale store that sold fancy foods and uh, it was a newer business and you know when you're doing a job like that and it's a new business you got to be open for anything so it went from cash registers to cutting meat to packing to being in the freezers which I hated because they were freezing cold um, to one day the boss says hey he goes I got in these railroad ties and he goes and they dropped them off but they're in the parking lot over there on the other side of the fence and those railroad ties need to come over here to this window well, and we're going to drop them all into this window well. And so I was working with my cousin at the time. He was short like me, but he was, he was pretty buff, so I'm like, okay, we got this. And uh, so we began to work on these railroad ties. Well, the problem was you had to, if you've ever touched a railroad tie, they're heavy and they're nasty. And so we began to lift one up and we had to take it and with our vertically challenged bodies, we had to lift it up on the fence and then come around the other side of the fence and then get it across. Well, I did that a couple times and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> this, this is not gonna work. This is not a good idea. So I said, you know, I got an idea. There's a tow motor inside the building. And I said, I'm gonna go get that tow motor and I'm gonna take it out. And I'm going to grab these railroad ties. I'm going to lift them up. And maybe we'll take them and just set them over the fence. My cousin goes, that's a great idea. So I go get the tow motor. I drive it outside on the streets, okay, all around the building. I bring it around to the front. I drive it through the gravel parking lot. Pick up a railroad tie. Set it up there. Get off the tow motor. Go on the other side of the fence. We take it off. I'm like, hey, that saved a lot of work. It's a good idea. Let's take it one more step further. I go, let me take that railroad tie, I'll drive the tow motor out onto the street, around the front, I'll drive up the sidewalk and we'll stop at the sidewalk and then we won't have as far to carry it. He goes, okay, I like that idea. So I do that once and then the third time I'm like, why not just make this easier? I go, I'll pick the railroad tie up, I'll drive around the street, I'll go through there, I'll pull around the front, I'll go to the sidewalk and then... I'll drive through the grass to the window. Tow motors are super heavy. They got flat tires that are made to be indoor buildings most of the time. This was not an outdoor, outside tow motor. I'm happy I'm driving it, cruising all around. I get right in front of that window and I go to drop it and the whole tow motor just buries itself in the grass. I mean, buried itself. And I look behind and I see these deep tracks to where I had this great idea. Boss comes out shortly after that. He looks at it and he is extremely upset. And he goes, whose bright idea was that? And my cousin was quick to point at me and I volunteered. I said, this is me. And he goes, why would you do that without asking or thinking? I go, I don't know. I don't know why I did it. So 
we had to call a tow truck. We had to get a tow truck with a really long hook. It had to try to connect to that. And then we had to drag that through the lawn in front of this business that I had already put the tracks in the, in the mud with. So at that moment, he was very mad, but he showed me some mercy. And after he calmed down, he said, don't ever do anything like that again without asking me. I go, check. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and the next day when I came into work, everything was fine. He showed me mercy. It could have been a lot worse. He could have, I could have been terminated. It was dumb enough to do something like that that I probably shouldn't have done without asking. Um, I could have maybe been, had to pay the expense of all the damage I caused, all those things. But he showed me mercy. I did have to look at those tracks and that tore up yard for about seven months after that. So I was always reminded of my, my failures. So if you would, we're going to talk about mercy today. All the examples of mercy in the Bible, we're going to talk about the mercy seat. So if you would turn in your Bibles to the second book of the Bible, Exodus, and we're going to start at chapter 25. All right, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we constantly mess up. We constantly make mistakes. And Lord, we are a sinful people. If we're left to ourselves, Lord, um, what we might think is the right thing can often be wrong. And Lord, the choices that we make can lead to sin and problems, not only for ourselves, but for the people around us, the people that we love and are with and spend part of our lives with. Lord, there is a need in our lives until you call us home for mercy. And Lord, today I pray that you will take your word, your living word, and show us some things that might help us to understand you even more and the plan that you have for our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Exodus chapter 25, and uh, we're going to start at verses 8 and 9. So this is God speaking to Moses here in this chapter. And verse 8 says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. So if it wasn't older English and, and New, New King James, it would say, make it just so. Everything had to be very articulated by God's hand of how he wanted the tabernacle to be built. And uh, actually, Jim, if you would put a picture up here, I want to show you. So this is an example of what the tabernacle might have looked like back then. And what I want us to see today and what I want you to think about is a little different. You're like, well, what does this have to do with today? What's it have to do with me? This has everything because the tabernacle and the way that God designed this and planned this all points to Jesus. So I want to talk you through that a little bit today. So when you look at the tabernacle on the east side, you'll see a different color there at the end. And that was the east gate into the tabernacle. And so that was the way that if you wanted to go find forgiveness for your sins and you had a sacrifice and you would enter through just that area. There's no other way that's open. No other way that's open. Just like Jesus is the only way to God the Father. So then when you would walk in, there was the brazen um, altar and that's where all the sacrifices would take place of the animals inside of there. And that's where the blood was shed and that's what took place in that part. And then when you would go past that, there was also um, like a, a basin where the priest would rinse themselves to make themselves clean before they would enter into the holy place. And that's the first part of the tent or the tabernacle tent there and then once you would get into that area there was a, a veil that was there and that was past that was the holy of holies 
was the most holy, sacred thing that the Jewish people had because it was a reflection of God's presence with them. And inside there was the Ark of the Covenant and a, and a, and a burning incense altar. And those were the only two things that were in the Holy Holies. All right, so let's, uh, let's pick back up here. All right, to verses uh, 10 through 16. And we talked, so this is God telling Moses how he wants to have the ark made. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width and a cubit and a half its height. And basically, it was almost four foot, like 3.75, almost four foot long. It was a little over two feet wide and it was a little over two foot tall. And that was like a picture like a box when you kind of have that in your mind. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it. And you shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark. And the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark and they shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I give you. So at this point when we're reading, um, the Ten Commandments hadn't yet been given to Moses and the people. So this is an illustration of what the ark might look like. Um, all gold, the wood is all wrapped in gold in the bottom. And then the top of the Ark of the Covenant is called the mercy seat. The Hebrew word basically calls it a lid. It's a place of atonement. And in the New King James Version and a lot of modern versions, it refers to the top of that as the mercy seat. And it was one solid piece of gold. So God definitely gifted a craftsman to uh, take and do some body work on a piece of gold and to make it all one solid piece and to be formed like that. So let's read about that a little bit. We pick back up here at verse 17. God's telling him about the top of it, the mercy seat. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubims of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one chair but one end and the other chair but the other end. And you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it one piece with the mercy seat. All one piece amazing craftsman that God had ordained there. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. And the faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony, or the Ten Commandments, that I will give you. And here's the part that's so unique about this time. And God says, and there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So that part the mercy seat was the most sacred part. This was literally God being with his people in a physical sense. And, you know, when we look at God, the creator, God, the father, God, the holy one, we, we don't have the cleanness. We don't have the right to be in God's presence. And so there was much that took place in order to come before the mercy seat. And so throughout every day, there would be priests later in the Bible that were called by God to go into the first part of the tabernacle and offer prayers and intercessions. And if like, if we were, if we represented the people of Israel, it would be on, on your behalf, and they would go in there. And then 
once a year, once a year, the high priest would take a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, and he'd have to do a sacrifice for himself first because he had to make himself clean because I don't know whether you know this or not, but pastors, preachers, priests, they're they're dirty too, full of sin. (laughs) Don't say amen too loud, but we, we are, we're broken. He was a man. And so he had to get himself cleansed first so that he could then go into the presence of God. And then he would take the sacrifice for the people's sins, for everybody else's, and he would take those in and they would go on top of the mercy seat. The blood would be sprinkled around it and then the blood would actually go on top of that where the cherubim looked down over it and God's presence was above there. And uh, if, if the priest went in there and he didn't have his heart right and he didn't have the right intentions or he didn't do it exactly the way God said, he could die. I and mean, sometimes God actually shows examples in his words of priests that went in there and did not follow the right plan that God had in store and, and they died. And so it was so, such a unique situation that they're behind the curtain and they would put bells on their feet and then a rope around it so that if you went in there and you're like, well, Pastor Ben didn't get his heart right. He went in there. I don't hear the bells anymore. Let's drag him out. <laughs> let's, let's get him out. He must have not done something right there. I think he did not acknowledge the sin that was in his own life. So it was a very serious moment. It was a very serious moment. And... Um, One thing that's not often talked about is we're going to jump forward in time. So most of us are familiar with how God gave Moses and his people the Ten Commandments. And so called Moses up on Mount Sinai. He went before God and in a cloud of fire, he actually voiced the Ten Commandments. And then this is the really neat part that I think about it is those stone tablets Moses didn't go up there with uh, an iPad and go, okay, all right, uh, thou shalt not. He he didn't go up there with a chisel. Can you imagine? What was that part? Thou shalt not what, Lord? What was the other one? I shouldn't. No. God himself actually wrote in the stone tablets the Ten Commandments. That's how sacred, that's how special they were. And then Moses comes down out of the mountain and he comes to the people and they're broken people, messed up, just like we are. And what they do? They took their gold and silver, they melted it all down and they built an idol. Why did that happen? Well, part of it was their environment. They lived in Egypt. They lived in Egypt and they were surrounded by idols. And the Egyptians were people who worshiped a lot of different things. They didn't worship God, but they worshiped a lot of different things. And so they were influenced by their culture. And they quickly, in the midst of miracles after miracle after miracle, they're like, well, we need something else. I know this isn't what God's got in store, but we just need something we can kind of see and put our hands on. Moses comes down and in his disgust, in his anger, he, he breaks the tablets and they, they end up getting smashed. So Moses is another example, a prequel a foreshadow of Jesus in a way because Moses was full of mercy. In his life later, he was full of mercy. And often when the people would mess up, when they would sin, when they would deny God, when they would do something so ridiculous to build another idol and God would be like, I'm bringing judgment. Moses was there going, Lord, please, (laughs) let's just, let's give them another chance. Let's give them another chance. And Moses was able to talk with God that way. And God brought Moses back up and he recarved again 
the Ten Commandments. Okay, so inside the Ark of the Covenant later on, there were three things that resided inside the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments, which we realize is super special because they represented the law that everybody was to live by, and they also were hand-carved by God himself. So those resided in there. The other thing, before, we, before I move on from that, the law is the proof. It's the plan that God had to show the Israelite people and all of us that we're broken that we can't follow all the rules successfully because we live in our flesh, we're surrounded by the world, we have the influence of the devil, and we mess up. So the law was there to prove to all of us that you need more than the law. The law is not going to save you. It's just going to show you a better way to live. I don't think anybody could argue if they really were honest and say, if I lived by the Ten Commandments principles, I'd have a better life. We'd all have a better life. Problem is, <laughs> we can't live by the Ten Commandments all the time. So the law was there. That was a reflection to show that we needed more than law. We needed grace. The next thing that's represented in there is, and I'm not going to turn to the scriptures today for the sake of time, but there was a golden container and it held manna. And so there was manna inside the ark. And you're like, what's the expiration date on manna? You know, how long does that last? I'm real picky about that. If Lori has something around the house and it's like, well, that expires tomorrow. I'm like, I'm done. I'm out. I don't do that. And she's like, it's good for another week. I go, no, I don't do that. And if I got hungry enough, obviously I'd eat it moldy, but whatever. I don't have to do that yet, thank the Lord. So there's manna in there. Now what, what does, why was manna important and why was it in the ark? There's a few reasons, I believe. One was the Israelites would have died in the desert if God wouldn't have provided them bread to live by. So that bread was life. That bread was life. And then I want you to see the meaning that that has for us today. What did Jesus say? He told people, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. When we celebrate communion and we talk about the Last Supper, what is one of the things Jesus does? He would take a piece of bread and he goes, this is my body, which is broken for you. Another prequel that points to Jesus. The third thing that was in there, a lot of people don't know about this, is uh, Aaron's rod. So Aaron was Moses' brother. He ended up being the high priest. And he, um, Moses and Aaron, in dealing with the people, at one point, they go, ah, we're kind of tired of Moses, <laughs> kind of tired of Aaron. We don't really like their direction. We don't like to hear about sin every day. We kind of hear, like, you know, how great we are and have a little bit more freedom. So we would like to get them out of their leadership roles and have somebody else be the priest for us. So again, Moses goes before God. God, it's just, can we make a way? Can we make a way that don't, don't judge them for this? They're just sheep. They're just sheep. Don't judge them. And so God said, yep, I got, a, I got a way that we'll do this. And he took a rod. And think of this as like a shepherd's staff, a rod. It would be a piece of wood that is carved out or maybe already mostly in the shape of something that you could protect yourself with, that you could help balance yourself with and steady yourself with, maybe even defend against a wild animal, all those different things. But it was a dead old piece of wood. The longer it was dead and the harder that wood got, the better it was for supporting. So they took all these staffs, one from each head of the tribes, there's 12, and they took Aaron's, and they carved Aaron's name in it, and they put it in there. And the next day, Moses went, went in to get these staffs. And here's where God did a miracle already. All the other staffs, they're just pieces of wood. Just pieces of wood. Some were nice, some were okay. But Aaron's, Aaron's wood, it budded. It blossomed. It not only blossomed, it produced almonds. 
Almonds don't grow overnight, but with God. So I think there was two key things there for us that point to Jesus. One is that showed that God chose Aaron to be the high priest. God ultimately chose Jesus to be the ultimate high priest. And also I think it shows us an example of what once was dead, that piece of wood was dead, it had no life, was brought back to life, the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. Another thing that points there. Um, If you would, turn to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 9. And we're going to go kind of quickly here. Actually, for the sake of time, let's skip that. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So in order to understand Hebrews, to understand the gospel, to understand more about what Jesus did for us, we have to look back at where it began. Thousands of years before Jesus was born, God designed it all. He pointed it all to the cross, to that place of atonement. So when God would look at the mercy seat and underneath of that mercy seat was the law that represented people who had broken and sinned and failed, the blood on the mercy seat from the sacrifice, that's what God saw. He saw blood. He saw the blood of a beautiful, innocent little lamb, the most perfect one that was around, that was brought in to shed the blood to offer forgiveness. And when God looked at his people for that year and he would look at him their sins were covered they were atoned for by the blood God loves us so much that that sacrifice came once a year it was hard to go within the presence before God but his plan all along let's turn to the last uh, reading today as we close to Hebrews chapter 10 Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. As we read this, I I want you guys to think about something. I want you to put something in your head for a minute. So today, and we just read there in 1 John, that Jesus became the atonement. He became the perfect lamb. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong. He lived a perfect life. And yet... He willingly died for you. Do we do anything to deserve that? No. Could we ever do anything to deserve that? No, we can't. So what happens today now that what's different between the Old Testament and today is when we look at the pure blood of Jesus, here's what I want you to think about. In your mind, just pause for a moment, and I want you to think of someone that you love with all your heart. Just think of that person. For some of you here today, maybe you have to think of that one person and you have to think of a certain time in your life where your love for them was just as full and beautiful as it could be. Maybe it's your son, maybe a daughter, grandchild, husband, wife, whoever God put upon your heart. So if you were in a position of judgment and you had to make things right because a sin took place, something that just requires justice, things just have to be made right and you have to do that and 
behind it, you see all the people and you see all their sins. And as a holy God, his wrath has to be fulfilled. He can't stand in sin. He can't accept sin. He's perfect. He's holy. So if we go back to our own eyes and let's say judgment is in your control and you see the sins of everybody around you, think of that one person that you love and picture them now standing in front of everybody else. They're there and and you're trying to bring justice and you're trying to look for a response, a judgment. And all you see is that person that you love and they won't move out of the way. And they're there and they're covering you from that. And all you see is them. Your love begins to swallow up that wrath. It begins to swallow up that judgment. That is how Jesus looks at us today. When I sin, when you sin, when we fall, when we do things that are uncomprehendable, when people who are lost go on and do things in this world that make us go, how could any human being ever do those things? Jesus looks God looks at Jesus and he not only sees Jesus who he loves, he sees Jesus' shed blood. Perfect blood shed for you. Let's read these last few verses. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus... In the old tabernacle, you had to have things right. There would be a fear. Have I been cleansed? Have things been made right? And then even then, only the select few could go before God. But now, therefore, brethren, we, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated through us, for us, through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from, the, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Jesus is the high priest. And for the Israelite sins to be forgiven on the mercy seat you had to come you had to come to it you had to have the priest take it to where you couldn't go any further and said take this for me so that I can find forgiveness so that I can find it now now with a pure heart not because of us or anything that we did but a heart that's pure because of the blood of Jesus. We get to come before God anytime we want, anywhere we want. Let's read on. Let us now, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. You know, I want you to remember this. When the world gets crazier, when things happen, when things take place and you're like, what is happening, God? How is this all happening? God designed a plan thousands of years before Jesus ever came that all it did was point to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are promises throughout his entire word and he is faithful. When you're wondering what's happening in the world, when you don't know how you're gonna handle the situation, when you don't know what you're gonna do, you need to be reminded God is faithful. God is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Praise team, if you could come up. Part of the beauty of the church, how God designed and intended the church to be, 
is when you're like the children of Israel and you're living in the land of Egypt and you're surrounded by sin, you're surrounded by people who are lost, you are surrounded by people who worship anything and everything except God Almighty. When we come together as a church, we remind each other and we stir up the good things, the love of Jesus. We talk about the blood that covers it all, that allows broken, unworthy people like you and me to come to Jesus and just say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Help me through this way, through this day. Help me find a way. And Lord, help me to love others along the way too. Sometimes as Christians, we all can get kind of upset with the way the world's going to people around us and we just kind of want to, maybe as my, my brother would say, I just want to bash some heads together. But we need to love them because they don't see yet. They don't see like you do. And they need to find a way. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we know that your Bible is a living, breathing word. And Lord, there's so much there. And to think that things in the Old Testament that are written that seem like they're just so far removed from everything that we do and say, all matter. And there's so much richness there that points us to what you designed from the beginning of time. And that Lord, you knew that we would need more than an animal sacrifice. That we would need perfect blood. And the only way, the only way to find that perfect eternal forgiveness was through the sacrifice of your son that you love so much that when you look on us now whether we are not even trying whether we're failing miserably and just going on about life or whether we're trying and we just keep messing up or we're doing our best but we still know that it's not perfect however that is you see us through the blood of Jesus and we are accepted and we are greatly loved. Thank you for that, Lord. I pray today, if someone is watching, if someone is here today, they've never had their sins covered and forgiven in the blood of Jesus. Now today they might just simply pray and say, Lord, cleanse me make me whole. Lord, if there's someone today that just been struggling, just not living the life they're supposed to, and they're not trying, I pray that today they might turn to you. Say, Lord, help me live a better way. Help me to be more like you, Jesus. And that they'd find a better way to live this life, and that you'd see them through it. We love you. We ask these things together in the name of Jesus.